Hi everyone, I am Dr. Anjani Devi, Associate Professor, Department of Biotechnology, Vignans Foundation for Science, Technology and Research. You know pretty well that I am dealing with the course enzyme technology. We are going through the syllabus included under Unit 2. So, after completion of this precipitation technique, we are moving towards another technique, which is nothing but dialysis. So, after protein precipitation, you got your protein precipitated, but along with your protein, there will be certain amount of salt. So, in order to go for the further purification methods, you need to separate your salt from the protein. So, dialysis, this method can be used in order to separate your salts from the protein. So, what is the principle involved in this particular technique? The separation is based upon molecular size. The principle involved in dialysis process is nothing but the separation is based upon the molecular size. So, what is dialysis? Dialysis is a process to separate dissolved molecules based upon the molecular weight. Moreover, the proteins that can the proteins can be separated from small molecules such as salts by using dialysis through a semi-permeable membrane which is mostly made up of cellulose. So, you are using a dialysis bag in order to carry out this dialysis process. I will explain you. A range of dialysis bags with a different pore size are available in the market. You can select a particular dialysis bag with a particular pore size based upon the diameter of your target protein or based upon the size of your protein. As we are considering the protein which is containing salt as your, as your contaminant, you want to separate the salt from the protein now. So, you have taken the dialysis bag, you have added clips at the end of the dialysis bag. You have added a one clip at end of one dialysis bag and now you have poured the protein, precipitated protein into this particular dialysis bag. So, when you have obtained this protein precipitate, you will be mixing it with a suitable buffer and now you are adding the buffer containing the target protein as well as the salt. After addition of your solution into the dialysis bag, you are adding another clip at the another end of the dialysis bag. Now, you have placed the dialysis bag in a beaker containing a suitable buffer. What's happening now? Gradually, as the dialysis pro process is carried out, as the dialysis process is carrying on, the salts that are present in this particular solution because of its small size, they will be coming outside the dialysis bag through the semi-permeable membrane. Only the proteins which have high molecular weight, they are retained within the dialysis bag. So, protein mixture is placed inside the dialysis bag which is then submerged in a buffer solution as I have told you. Then, molecules having dimensions significantly greater than the pore diameter of the dialysis bag or retained within inside the dialysis bag. Smaller molecules and the ions that are capable of passing through the pores of the membrane diffuse down. Let us see here. All these are salt particles which have diffused out of the dialysis bag. Only the proteins are available inside the dialysis bag. Protein. The disadvantage of this particular technique is nothing but you will be obtaining your protein under very diluted condition. So, I will go with another technique that can be used for protein separation. Now, we will deal with gel filtration chromatographic process. Whenever I am saying that we are using chromatographic technique, first we need to know what is the main principle involved in the chromatographic technique. In every chromatographic techniques, there are two phases. One is your stationary phase and another one is your mobile phase. You are using two phases that is stationary phase as well as the mobile phase and you are separating the various 
solute components of the mixture between these two phases. You have to remember this basics very clearly. The various solute molecules present in the mixture are getting separated between the stationary phase and the mobile phase. With this basics, now I am moving towards gel filtration chromatography. This gel filtration chromatography is also called as molecular exclusion chromatography. So, other name for this gel filtration chromatography is molecular exclusion chromatographic technique and the principle involved in the separation is nothing but the molecular size. So, various solute molecules will be separated based upon their molecular size. Now, as I have told you, we need to have both stationary phase and mobile phases. The stationary phase we can consider during the gel filtration chromatography is nothing but your porous beads which are generally made up of cephadics or cepherose. So, mostly you are using either cephadics or cepherose as your stationary phase. Then you need to know what are the mobile phases that can be used for the separation through this gel filtration chromatography. We can either use buffers, okay. We can use tetrahydrofurans, chloroform, dimethyl formum, mild. So, we can use various solvents as mobile phase. Now, I will explain the procedure involved in gel filtration process. The very important step you need to do before you start the separation process during gel filtration is nothing but packing of the column. What is that? It is nothing but packing of the column. What is a column? How you are going to pack the column? So, this is nothing but if this is a column and you are going to pack the column with a proper stationary phase. Here in this particular technique, we are using porous beads as stationary phase. Before you start the separation process, you have to make the stationary phase, you have to pack the stationary phase within the column. How you are going to pack the stationary phase? First, you need to select the porous beads, whether it is cephadics or cephorose. Depending upon your interest, you have to select the porous beads. And now, you have to place this porous beads in a suitable buffer where these beads will be very much stable. So, then you have to start adding this porous bead very slowly at a constant rate. There should not be difference in the rate. It should be added to the column at a constant rate and it should be packed continuously. If you give any breaks in between, there is a chance of improper formation of the column. If your column is not properly packed, your mixture is not going to have a proper separation. So, column packing is very important step before separation of your mixture. So, when you are packing the column, you have to maintain a proper constant flow rate and now once the column is completely packed, you have to allow certain amount of buffer to stand on the upper layer of your bead. You should never expose your bead to the air because if the beads are exposed to the air, they are going to get dried up, they will be choked. So, because of this drying up of the beads, the proper separation will not take place. So, never you should, you should allow your beads to expose to the air. Always put a allow a certain amount of buffer to stand over the surface of the beads. Now, you have completed your column packing. You have to go for separation of your mixture. So, when you are ready to add the mixture onto the surface of your column, you have to remove the excess buffer that is present. Otherwise, there is a chance of dilution. So, you have to remove the excess buffer that is present on the surface of your beads. Only you have to allow only certain amount of buffer to stand on the surface. And now, with the along with the mobile phase, you are adding the mixture of proteins onto the surface of your column. I have told you that you can use any sort of buffer or any other solvent that is suitable, which have the compatibility with the stationary phase and the mixture 
of proteins that to be separated you have to choose that particular mobile phase so you are now continuously supplying the mobile phase how the separation is taking place here let us consider that you have given a mixture which are containing various proteins of different molecular size so the proteins which are having different molecular size can be efficiently separated by using this technique so your protein your mixture contain proteins of various molecular size when you have added the proteins onto the surface of your column and allowed the mobile phase only the macro molecules that means large size proteins they will be traveling through the void spaces that are present in between the porous beads what is void space void space is nothing but the space that is present between the beads so your macro molecules will be traveling through the void space present between the beads whereas your micro your small sized proteins will be traveling through the porous beads let us see this figure let us consider this one as a bead this is a bead your small molecular size proteins they will be traveling through the bead whereas your macro molecules they are traveling through the wide spaces that are present between the beads because they are traveling through the void spaces they will be traveling more faster when compared to your micro molecules which are traveling through the bead the small molecular sized small sized protein molecule they will be spending more time within the column when compared to your macro molecules thus you have to remember that when you have added the mixture of proteins of different molecular size first you will be getting your macro molecules eluted first then only your micro molecules will be eluted so what is the main reason because of which the macro molecules and micro molecules are eluting out at different speeds and at different time intervals this is all because of this. the macro molecules are traveling through the void spaces and they are traveling very fastly and your micro molecules are taking long time because they are also traveling through the beads of the stationary phase by using this gel filtration chromatography you can pretty well separate the salts present in your protein mixture as salts are having less molecular weight or they are having less size they are traveling out they will be eluted out slowly whereas your protein will be eluted out fastly and now after learning about gel filtration chromatography let's see the chromatography another chromatographic technique which is nothing but your ion exchange chromatographic technique what is this ion exchange chromatographic technique and what is the principle on which your proteins are getting separated the principle on which the proteins present in your mixture are getting separated is nothing but your charge so separation is based upon the charge of your protein here as i have already told you that every chromatographic technique will be having a stationary phase and a mobile phase in the ion exchange chromatography the stationary phase will be ion exchanger whereas you can consider buffers of variable concentrations or various salt concentrations as your mobile phase so now you have to know the principle so ion exchange chromatography relies on the attraction attraction of oppositely charged ion exchanger and the analyte analyte is nothing but your protein sample so you know you know that opposite charges will attract whereas the like charges will be repelling so you know the funda that opposite charges will be attracting whereas the like charges will be repelling so with this concept we i'm going to explain about the ion exchange chromatography the separation in this particular chromatographic technique is mostly depending upon the attraction of oppositely charged ion exchanger and the protein molecule and now you have to know that mostly two types of ion exchangers are used in this particular thing and the one ion exchanger is nothing but your 
cation exchanger and the second type of ion exchanger is nothing but anion exchanger examples for cation exchanger is nothing but carboxy methyl cellulose whereas example for anion exchanger is nothing but your diethyl amino ethyl cellulose that is nothing but deae cellulose coming to this cmc cellulose i have told you that that is a cation exchanger so cm cellulose will be having a negative charge on it that means this is a cation and it will be having a negative charge on it and the proteins which are having the positive charge they will be attracted towards this particular negative charge and if at all you consider this deae cellulose this exchanger will be having a positive charge on it this anion exchanger will be having positive charge on it and it will be attracting the negative charged protein molecules they will be combining with negative charged protein molecules so you have to remember that this cation exchanger will be having negative charge and anion exchanger will be having positive charge don't get confused between these two now i'll explain you by considering this exchanger let us consider a anionic exchanger as you pretty well know that anionic exchanger will be having a positive charge the we have taken a column and we have packed the stationary phase in it we have packed the column with positive charge anionic exchanger and when you have allowed the mixture of proteins to pass through this exchanger the protein which will be having positive as well as the negative charge you have taken the mixture of proteins when you have added a mixture onto this anionic exchanger only the negative charged proteins will be attracted towards the anionic exchanger whereas the positive charged proteins they will be eluted out because you know the funda that opposite charges attract each other similarly if you consider cationic exchanger the stationary phase contains cationic exchanger that will be having the negative charge when you have added the mixture of proteins only the positive charged proteins will be attracted whereas the negative charged proteins will be eluted out so i think you you understand the funda clearly now so only in the case of this anionic exchanger as they contain positive charge only the negative charged proteins will be attracted towards the stationary phase whereas the the positive charged proteins are eluted out in that also the proteins with negative charge they will exhibit different types of affinity towards this particular phase stationary phase some will be binding very strongly to the stationary phase and some negative charged proteins will be loosely bound so when you start adding the buffer suitable buffer the proteins which are not strongly attracted towards the stationary phase they will be eluted first so you can elute the proteins which are having less affinity for the stationary phase and now you are left over with the proteins which are having stronger bonding with the stationary phase and now how to elute this proteins that are present inside your exchanger so what is this technique called as this is called as elution technique you can use different types of different methods to elute this particular proteins i'll show you what are those techniques here the proteins will bind to the ion exchanger with different affinities yeah i've told you that as the column is washed with buffer as you continuously supply the buffer which is nothing but your mobile phase the proteins which have relatively less affinity i've told you that the components of the proteins which have less affinity they will be eluted first with the buffer they will be eluted more fastly through the column whereas the proteins which have bound tightly to the column they will be eluted 
very slowly. The greater the binding affinity of that particular protein to the ion exchanger, it will be eluted very slowly. So, when you have, when you start eluting, the proteins which have less affinity will be eluted first and the proteins which have more affinity will be eluted slowly. And then, proteins can be eluted by using various techniques I have told you. We can elute the protein which have bound to the column either by using solutions, various solutions with increasing salt concentration or by using buffers or by changing the pH of the particular solution. You can elute the proteins either by gradient elution method or stepwise elution method. So, the proteins with less affinity will be eluted first and the proteins with strong affinity will be eluted when you go on changing the buffers or either by adding solution of various salt concentrations. Now, let me explain about another technique, another chromatographic technique which is nothing but affinity chromatography. So, coming to the affinity chromatographic technique, as I have told you that each and every chromatographic technique will be having two phases. Here in this particular chromatographic technique also you need to have a stationary phase and you need to have a mobile phase. In this, you are using a chromatography column. First you are packing the stationary phase and you are using specific ligands which have complementarity or specificity with the target protein. You are immobilizing the ligands to the stationary phase of your column through covalent bonds. Your ligand of interest is immobilized to the stationary phase through covalent bonds. So, once you have prepared your column, then you start separating your proteins. So, you have prepared your column with the ligands and now you have to add the mixture of proteins. All the proteins which have various sizes, shapes, they will be eluted out. Only the protein which is having specificity for that ligand will be retained, will be attached to the ligand and retained within the column. See, in the second step, all the other proteins are eluting outside. Only the protein which is having affinity for this particular ligand, it is attached to the ligand and it is residing within the column. Enough. How? You can separate these proteins from the column. I will tell you about this. So, coming to this, what is the main principle involved in this affinity chromatography? Many proteins can bind specifically to the ligand molecules. As I have told you that enzymes are proteins and enzymes have very important property called as specificity. By using this particular property of this particular enzyme, we are going to separate these particular proteins or enzymes from the rest of these proteins using this particular chromatographic technique. So, as I have told you that we are adding the various protein components, we have added the protein mixture and the proteins with only affinity will be bound to your ligand. Now, I have to tell you, I have to explain you about what are the various sorts of ligands that can be used for various substrate molecules. If your target molecule is your substrate analog, then use enzyme as ligand. If your target molecule is an antigen, then use antibody as ligand. If your target molecule is a polysaccharide, then use lectin as your ligand. So, if you want to separate biotin, you need to add evidin as ligand. So, based upon the target protein, you have to fix your ligand. So, after this, I will explain the entire process now. So, you have taken this inert surface that is nothing but your stationary phase which was attached with ligand using covalent bonds and then 
you have allowed the mixture of proteins to pass through this particular column where the unwanted proteins will be eluted out without binding to the ligand and only the proteins which are having the affinity for the ligand they are getting bound to the ligand. So, once your target protein is getting attached to the ligand, how you can elude this target protein? One thing is you can, you can change the pH, ionic strength or the temperature so that you can separate the protein ligand complex. Otherwise, you can add another ligand which have more affinity for your target protein. See, if you are here, your protein is attached to one ligand. If you add another ligand to which your protein is having more affinity, then your protein is going and binding with that particular ligand and you can separate that protein very easily now. So, to remove this protein of interest through the column, you can elute with the solution of compounds with higher affinity than the ligand, which is nothing but your competitive ligand. I want you people to see this video in order to gain more knowledge about this particular topic. Protein purification. Why do we need purified protein? By analyzing pure protein, we can determine amino acid sequences and investigate a protein's biochemical function. Besides, crystallization of proteins need pure protein. And we can obtain X-ray data from the protein crystals with a picture of tertiary structure, which is the actual functional unit of the protein. For pure protein is so important for further analysis, we will discuss the protein purification methods which usually used. Purified protein contains only one type of protein which we are interested in. At beginning, this protein may be only a tiny fraction of the complex. How could we know we isolate the particular protein we need? We need an assay for some unique identifying property of the protein, so that we can tell when the protein is present or whether this is a target protein. Determining an effective assay is often difficult. For enzymes, which are protein catalysts, the assay is usually based on the reaction that the enzyme catalyzes in the cell. For already known protein, there is a more convenient method. Western blot. We can use specific antibody to analyze the target protein. These methods will be used after the purification process. We'll talk about this later. When you know how to analyze whether your purification process is successful, we can start to purify the protein now. First, the protein need be released from cell. There are several methods to disrupt the cell membrane. Sonication is a common method. Others include French press, enzymatic or chemical cleavage of the cells, and freeze thawing. For larger scale continuous disruption, high pressure homogenization, or beat milling are widely used. After that step, the mixture is fractionated by centrifugation. Here, we need make some trials or dependent on previous experience to make sure the target protein enriched in which component of the fractions. The differential centrifugation yields a dense pellet of heavy material at the bottom of the centrifuge tube, and a lighter supernatant above. Then the supernatant is again centrifuged at a greater force to yield, yet another pellet and supernatant. In the centrifugation process, the mixture yields several fractions of decreasing density, each still containing hundreds of different proteins, which are subsequently assayed for the further purification. Proteins could be purified according to their basic characteristics, such as solubility, size, charge, and specific binding affinity. Usually, protein mixtures are subjected to a series of separations each based on a different property to yield a pure protein. Most proteins are less soluble at high salt concentrations, an effect called salting out. The salt concentration at which a protein precipitates differs from one protein to another. Hence, salting out can be used to fractionate proteins. Salting out is also useful for concentrating dilute solutions of proteins including active fractions obtained from other purification steps. 
Dialysis can be used to remove the salt in above step. Proteins can be separated from small molecules by dialysis through a semi-permeable membrane, such as a cellulose membrane with pores. Proteins have greater dimensions than the pore diameter and are retained inside the dialysis, whereas smaller molecules and ions traverse outside the bag through the pore. However, this process could not distinguish between proteins effectively. Chromatography is the more discriminating separations on the basis of size. The column consists of porous beads made of insoluble but highly hydrated polymers such as dextran or agarose or polyacrylamide. We applied sample on the top of a column, the small molecules can enter the pores of the beads, but large ones cannot. Thus, the small molecule goes both inside and between the beads, whereas large one goes only between the beads. Small molecules flow longer distance than the larger molecules. So, the large molecules flow more rapidly through this column and emerge first. Molecules that are of a size to occasionally enter a bead will flow from the column at an intermediate position, and small molecules, which take a longer, tortuous path, will exit last. Ion Exchange Chromatography Proteins may have net positive or negative charge at different pH range. This is another basic rules for protein separate. If a protein has a net positive charge, it will usually bind to a column of beads containing carboxylate groups. Whereas a negatively charged protein will bind to a column of beads containing diethyl and monothyl group. Protein sample loads on the column, a positively charged protein binds to the beads. Another charged protein will flow through this column and emerge first. The positively charged protein, for example, can be eluted by increasing the concentration of sodium chloride or another salt in the eluding buffer because sodium ions compete with positively charged groups on the protein for binding to the column. Proteins with less net positive charge released first, then the higher charge density proteins. There are lots of ion exchange chromatography. You need to choose suitable chromatography depends on the character of your interest in protein. Affinity chromatography. Affinity chromatography is another powerful and generally applicable means of purifying proteins. This technique takes advantage of the high affinity of many proteins for specific chemical groups. For example, Knee polystyrene resin is widely used for the purification of his tag protein. His protein has affinity for knee polystyrene. When passing a column containing knee polystyrene, his tagged protein attached to the modified resin, whereas most other proteins do not. Affinity chromatography is a powerful means of isolating transcription factors. A protein mixture is percolated through a column containing specific DNA sequences attached to a matrix. Proteins with a high affinity for the sequence will bind and be retained. After that, the transcription factor could be washed by high concentration salt solution. In conclusion, affinity chromatography isolates target protein in three steps. Firstly, attaching the chemical group which could affinity with target protein to the column. Secondly, loading the sample into the column, and let the target protein affinity with chemical group. Thirdly, eluding the target protein by high concentration salt solution or other method to decrease binding affinity. High pressure liquid chromatography. The resolving power of all of the column techniques can be improved substantially through the use of a technique called high pressure liquid chromatography. This techniques could enhance the ability of other columns discussed above. The column materials themselves are much more finely divided and, as a consequence, there are more interaction sites and thus greater resolving power. When using HPLC, the samples load into the column and move through the stationary phase under the pressure. For different material have different affinity with stationary phase. The objects leave the column in different time. The detector obtains various peak signal and each peak represents a different kind of compound. After comparing analysis of these signals, we will know the material contained in the sample. The net result is high resolution as well as rapid separation.
After all the purification steps, how could we know our purification scheme is effective? Apart from specific activity rises in each purification step, another method is using electrophoresis to display the target proteins at each step. Proteins can be separated largely on the basis of mass by electrophoresis in a polyacrylamide gel under denaturing conditions. SDS polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is rapid, sensitive, and capable of a high degree of resolution. We can examine the efficacy of our purification scheme by analyzing a part of each fraction by SDS page. The initial fractions will display dozens to hundreds of proteins. As the purification progresses, the number of bands will diminish, and the prominence of one of the bands should increase. This band will correspond to the protein of interest. In case some protein may have similar weight with the target protein, we need to run isoelectric focusing first. Isoelectric focusing can be combined with SDS page to obtain very high resolution separations. Proteins can also be separated electrophoretically on the basis of their relative contents of acidic and basic residues. The isoelectric point of a protein is the pH at which its net charge is zero. Protein with similar weight are less possible have same pi, thus, using two-dimensional electrophoresis, proteins have been separated in the horizontal direction on the basis of isoelectric point and in the vertical direction on the basis of mass. Besides quality analysis of protein purification, we also need quantify the target protein at each step. If the target protein is an enzyme, we could determine the protein concentration by enzyme activity. On the other hand, if the target protein doesn't have the enzyme activity, we could semi-quantify the target protein through SDS page gel, which could analysis the percentage of the target protein in total sample. A good purification scheme takes into account both purification levels and yield. A high degree of purification and a poor yield leave little protein with which to experiment. A high yield with low purification leaves many contaminants in the fraction, and complicates the interpretation of experiments. Finally, mass spectrometry could determine the target protein mass more precisely. These methods are called matrix-assisted laser desorption ionization and electrospray spectrometry. Using this method, we could learn more about our target protein. So, in this particular session, we have discussed about various techniques used for purifying your target protein. In that, we have discussed about ultrafiltration, we have discussed about precipitation technique, then we have discussed about dialysis, then we have discussed about gel filtration, ion exchange chromatographic techniques along with affinity chromatographic method. So once you think that you have underwent all the purification process, you need to check how far your target protein got purified, how far your target protein got separated from the rest of the proteins. For that, you can go for electrophoretic technique. So, electrophoretic technique is used to separate the molecules either in gel or fluid using electric field. In the electrophoretic technique, the proteins will be separated based upon the molecular size and electrical charge. So, in this electrophoretic technique, various components either it may be protein or DNA or RNA they will be getting separated from one another or among themselves based upon molecular size and electric charges. Coming to the other technique used for determining the purity of that particular protein is nothing but your protein sequencer. You know pretty well that, that protein is a polymer and amino acids are the building blocks of this particular protein. If your protein is in purified form, you will be getting the exact amino acid components or related to that particular protein. So, you can upon choosing, upon studying the sequence of this amino acids, you can determine the protein.
So, protein sequencing, this technique is used for determining the amino acid sequence of the protein or a peptide. What is a peptide? A short form of a protein is nothing but a peptide. So, by studying the sequence of amino acid, you can determine the purity of your protein. Moreover, this pro protein sequencing technique can be used, can serve to identify and characterize the protein as I have already told you. And now, we can also use mass spectrometry. Apart from these two methods, we can also use mass spectrometry metry in order to go for analyzing the purity of that particular protein. In this particular mass spectroscopy, we are going to determine this particular technique depends upon the molecular weight. Through this technique, we can separate the proteins based upon their M by Z ratio that is nothing but your mass to charge ratio. So, by using these techniques, you can see how far you, your target protein have got purified. The very important funda you people need to understand is you have to choose the techniques very cautiously. In order to purify the protein, it's better if you choose less steps. That means less techniques. That means as you go on increasing the number of purification steps of the protein, the yield of the protein will be definitely going to reduce. So, as a summary, I want to tell you that you will be getting the increased yield of the protein if you reduce the number of purification steps. So, you need to first study the properties of your target protein and you have to select the exact purification technique. If you go on increasing or increase using a number of purification steps, your protein yield is going to reduce. So, be wise, select proper purification techniques and get more yield of the protein. I want you people to go through these links so that you can gain more information about this particular topic. Please work out on these following questions in order to assess yourself. Thank you.